This is the Embraced Fully interview series. We meet every month on the first Thursday to learn from experts in the field of prison volunteer work and reentry. We also have an angel team workshop meeting on the third Thursday of each month. Our primary activity is to help create angel teams of mostly volunteer Christian scientists from around the country who come together to assist returning community members successfully re-enter society after incarceration in prison or jail. I wanted to let everybody know we have locked in the venue for our second annual Embrace Fully conference. It's going to be held on the weekend of May 4th. So that'll be May 3rd and 4th in 2024. And it's going to be in Dallas, Texas. Oh, yeah. uh, and we will be holding the conference at the Thanksgiving Square. So we're super excited for that. We'd love it if you would save the date to join us. We would love to have all of you join us either in person, ideally, or via Zoom. There will be an email with registration information for that coming soon. If you are on this call right now and you're not already subscribed to the Embraced Fully email list, please go to embracedfully.org slash subscribe to sign up and you'll receive the Zoom notifications for our meetings. We are a fiscally sponsored program of the Principal Foundation, which means we receive advice and administrative support and also the ability to collect tax deductible donations because they are a 501c3 nonprofit. We do not receive any direct funding from the Principal Foundation, and that means that we rely 100% on donors for our funding. We do have a $10,000 matching grant that is still active through the end of 2023. We've gotten a number of uh, donations that have been matched. There's still some left in that, so we really appreciate every donation that that those gifts are being doubled right now. So even more chance to make a nice impact. If you'd like to make a donation, please visit embracefully.org slash donate. If you or your church would like to make a donation, you can do that as a one-time or a monthly recurring donation. Please remain on mute until the Q&A portion at the end. And with that, I'll hand it over to David Fowler, who I think is going to hand it off to Bob. <laughs> Okay. Hello, everybody. And we're really excited that uh, you could join us here for this interview with Richard Miles. Richard is the executive director of, of milesoffreedom.org, and they're in Dallas, Texas. And uh, take a look at their website. They do extraordinary work helping people that are coming out of prison. Also, I've asked Bob Woodard there in Dallas if he could just say a few words before we get started. He knows Richard. So, Bob, if you're ready and available, can you just give a few words before I start in my interview? Well, thank you. It's a it's a privilege uh, to introduce Richard Miles to you. Um, I met Richard in May of this year. We met at a annual interfaith interfaith organization meeting called the Thanksgiving Foundation which of course manages Thanksgiving Square, which is where our annual conference is gonna be. There were over 500 people at that luncheon. And as I was walking, wending through the tables that were cleared, trying to get to the door, I ran into this man named Richard Miles. We'd never met before. We started up a conversation just quickly and Richard gave me his a 25 words or less introduction. And I said, Richard, it's no coincidence that we've met. I'm a volunteer prison chaplain helping returning community members. And here you are having an organization helping returning community members. We've got to meet. So we did, and we have, and we've met several times since then, really with the objective of having Miles of Freedom, which is Richard's organization, partner with us going forward as a resource to help us better minister to our returning community members. So it's a real blessing for us in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And Richard will probably tell you about his aspirations. He certainly wants to go 
national, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful organization. Let me say this about Richard. I, I've said this to people, Richard, and, and not to your face, but Richard is the real deal. He is a extremely successful returning community member and has an incredible story to tell. I'm not going to tell it now. He's going to tell it. But I also want to add that he was first published by the Christian Science Monitor in 2012. And if I'm not mistaken, Richard, you're working on a second article that will soon be published in the Christian Science Monitor to catch up on all the good that Richard is doing and his organization. So I don't, I would, it's a privilege to introduce you, Richard, and have you address the people on this call. And we look forward to meeting with you and seeing you soon. All right, thank you, Bob. Okay, Richard, are you there? <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. Uh, I, I'm super, I'm like, I'm super stoked ever since Bob, I met Bob. Thank you for that a beautiful introduction. You know, I, I'm just blessed to be here and it's been a pleasure to correspond with you, David, via email. So I'm excited and looking forward to an engaging conversation. Yeah, nice to see you, actually see you. So that's really cool. So, Richard, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and family life. That is before your life was abruptly altered and changed, which we're going to get into next. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So once again, it's a, it's a blessing and it's an honor to be able to um, share space with each of you. I'm looking, it's like 59 people on here. So from different <laughs> time zones. So I appreciate the time sacrifice. So, you know, my name is Richard Miles, and I'm, I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas, in a community called Oak Cliff. You know, I was raised up in a very, I would call it very spiritually guided household. My dad was a bishop. He was ordained as a bishop eventually. My mom uh, was a early school educator. I have two younger brothers and an older sister. And I, I think when I think back on my life, uh, we had three pillars that kind of structured our household. One was obviously church. The other was education. And the final piece was family. Uh, my dad was very strict on like going to after school activities. We couldn't do those types of things. It was a lot of things that we couldn't do based upon his belief, but it really structured me as a young person growing up. If you know anything about um, Dallas, I went to Skyline High School, which is one of the one of the best high schools as it relates to vocational training. I love Skyline High School and got into classics technology, which really put me on a path to going to TSTC, which was a college in Waco that focused on classics engineering. And so that was kind of like my life growing up, very family centric. Wow, thank you. Uh, that's an interesting backdrop because your story is pretty unique, you know. And on your website that you write, and I'm reading here, it says, I spent 15 years in Texas prisons as a result of being wrongfully convicted of murder and aggravated assault. For 15 years of my life, as I had known it, it ceased to exist. I felt kidnapped by a system that stripped me of my sense of individuality. So here's my first question about your story. What initially brought about your incarceration? Yes, sir. So thank you for that question right there. And, and when we put together this about us for miles of freedom, we were very intentional about the wording. And I know later on down the line, we will go into the word of why I use the word kidnapping, but, you know, after I graduated from high school, I was working at McDonald's making $4.25 an hour. I graduated in 1993. And so the aspirations of pursuing college was before me. I moved out, you know, from the house that I was staying in and moved in 
with one of the assistant managers at McDonald's to kind of begin my life as I knew it. And navigating outside of the confines of my mom's house, I didn't really take into the consideration how the shelter protects you from the unseen. Mm. And mm. as a young man, not having any um, intuitions of hurting anyone or anything like that, I just really navigated um, through life. I met a girl named Betty Hogan, who became my kind of like girlfriend. And so we would, I would go over her house and she would come visit me. And May 15th, 1994, I remember waking up. It was a Sunday morning, the sun was shining and I had moved to North Dallas. And I told my friend that I stayed with, I told him and said, can you drive me to Oak Cliff, which is another part of Dallas because I want to visit Betty. So my friend got up, he drove me from North Dallas to Oak Cliff and I pretty much stayed with Betty all that day in these apartments. I had a couple of more friends in the apartments. I had a gentleman by the name of Bo who stayed with his mother in the back of the apartment. So here I am going from the back to the front, visiting friends and so forth. And around about 1.30 that um, night, you know, it was about time for me to go home. And in Dallas, the buses had stopped running. And so I went to my friend Bo, who was stay who stayed in the apartments, and I asked him, could he drive me home? The ironic thing was Bo had a girlfriend that stayed right around the corner from me. She stayed on the corner of University and Roper. I stayed on the corner of Crest Haven and Bluffview. And so a lot of, of a lot of us that's on this line is not familiar with that area, but it's probably about a three or four block walk. I remember leaving Oak, leaving, leaving Oak Cliff, heading back to the house to North Dallas. My friend Bo got to his girlfriend's house first, who stayed on the corner of University and Roper. So instead of him passing her house to take me home, I offered my $5 and I said, well, I can walk the rest of the way home. Mm -hmm. I remember getting out the car and it was May. So it was kind of like the cool weather and I'm walking up university and I'm right by Love Fear Airport. <clears throat> the Sewell Cadillac shops are right across the street. They line Lemon Avenue. And so I make a right and I'm walking in front of the Sewell Cadillacs and Bluffview is an intersecting street. And so I turned down Bluffview to go to the Red Coleman liquor store. The reason being, this was before cell phones had got out, right? So I had to use the pay phone to call my friend to ask him to unlock the lock on the house as well as cut the alarm off. Got to the pay phone, David, called my friend James that I was staying with. He woke, he woke up groggily because, as you know, it's in the middle of the night, but he did cut out the alarm. And as I crossed the street, I noticed a police car that was sitting kind of idle on mm -hmm. Bluffview, and it was facing Lover's Lane, which is the street that runs parallel to Lemon Avenue. Didn't really pay any attention to it, walked by the police car, and the next thing I heard was a helicopter. I didn't do anything wrong. So I looked up and in the recesses of my mind, I was like, well, something has went on in this neighborhood. Let me get on to the house. And it seems as immediately as that thought entered my mind, police cars came from everywhere. And I'm hearing these demands, get on the ground, get on the ground. So I'm 19 years old, police cars everywhere. I'm laying prostrate on the ground. An officer comes up, he puts handcuffs on me. He reads me my Miranda rights and he puts me in a police car. And I'm telling him, I said, man, what's going on? I said, my friend just dropped me off. He's right around the corner. We can go talk with him. And the officer told me, well, we're taking you downtown. Once you get downtown, you'll be introduced to a detective. You can tell the detective everything that you're telling me and you should be free to go. My story didn't end as that, and we'll get into it more as it as, as we go on into our conversation. But what I will say is one of the first challenges, one of the first errors that happened in my case was the procedures in which the police officers took that arrested me. 
instead of them taking me straight downtown, they stopped at this Texaco. Now, when we got to this Texaco, I noticed police lights, I noticed ambulance cars, and they take me out of the police car. They conduct a gunshot residue test <clears throat> on my hands. We're at Bachman Lake, which is a lake in North Dallas. So we're like right behind the Bachman Lake area. And they conduct a gunshot residue test on my hands while the handcuffs were still on me. Placed me in the police car, and then I ended up downtown at the Capers building. And so that was kind of like what happened that night. I would later learn on that about five miles away from where I was walking, a shooting had occurred shortly after a club had let out. Two gentlemen were sitting in a white 300 ZX after they had left a club. Multiple people was hanging around the gas station. A gentleman comes from behind the gas station, shoots into this car that had the T-tops off of it. They killed the driver and they shot the, they wounded the passenger. Hmm. 10 witnesses saw this incident occur that night. All 10 witnesses provided information to the detective. Nine of them said I was not the shooter. Well, so what, what happened? I mean, you obviously, you got sentenced somehow. Yeah. So basically when I got to the detective station, I was introduced to the detective. And the detective asked me where I had been that day. I knew every phone number of the people that I was no with that color. day. This was back when you needed to remember phone numbers because this was pre-sale phone. So I gave the detective the phone numbers to James. James was the friend that I stayed with in North Dallas. I gave him Betty's number. That was my girlfriend. I gave him Bo's number. That's the gentleman that drove me from Oak Cliff back to North Dallas. I gave him Bo's mom's number because we left from her apartment and I gave him Carla's number. Carla was Bo's girlfriend. All of these people could attest to um, my whereabouts that evening and I had just been arrested. So I didn't have time to call all of these people to ask them to corroborate with the story that I had given. Yeah. The detective went out, stayed gone for about six or seven hours, and he came back in and he said, well, Richard, all of your alibis said that you checked out, that you was with them. I say, but we have a witness that say they saw you kill one person and shoot another person, and you're going to be arraigned for murder and attempted murder. Wow. And so yeah. at that point, I was escorted to Lou Sterry County Jail where my bond was set for $350,000. It was $200,000 for the murder and it was $150,000 for the attempted murder. And it was at this point that I was able to finally call my mom and my dad to kind of let them know where I was at and what I was getting ready to go through. Well, that had to be pretty difficult on them for sure. <laughs> it was on you. So let me just kind of jump to, you were incarcerated, obviously. I just want to ask, what was your first day of prison like? What thoughts were you thinking? Is there any fears for your safety? What did you hear about prison that, you know, may have caused you any concern? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and as I, you know, you sent the questions to me earlier, and I've just been digesting them over and over again. And you know, I went through four stages of incarceration, four different emotions. And, and the stages were fear, anger, depression, and then I had this opportunity to evolve. And so for me, this was my first time ever being engaged with our criminal legal system. And so going to prison, I had no knowledge of prison. And so we understand that fear is absent of knowledge. I didn't have an opportunity to be angry with being wrongfully incarcerated because I didn't understand the conditions and the environment in which I had been placed in. 
right? And so for the first five years, I lived in a in a constant state of fear. Fear of the other individuals, other other men that was incarcerated with me, fear of the officers not understanding the rules and guidelines when you're incarcerated. You don't go through a deep orientation. You're just incarcerated. So much like the movie Shawshank Redemption, where the gentleman Andy just follows everyone else. And so as I learned the system, as I learned what officers to stay away from, as I learned how to navigate different men that was incarcerated, the knowledge of doing time subsided, but the anger of being falsely in prison, the reality that growing up, you know, my dad was a disabled veteran. Um, as I said, my mom was a school teacher. And so I grew up um, with the understanding that our, our, our system is to protect us. My dad being a very spiritual person, he always believed that the truth shall set you free. And so when all of these structures that you grew up on are challenged, the anger sets in, right? But for me, it was hard to find one person to be angry at. I was angry at the police. I was angry at the prosecutor. I was angry at the detective, my attorney. It even got to a point because I had a court appointed attorney, I was angry at my family because I felt like they could have put the house up or put the car up, anything that they could have done. Right. But anger without resolve is not a good place to lay your head. And so I easily felt that anger wasn't a place that I wanted to do my time in. Yeah. And I understood that anger was an emotion. After yeah. the anger left, the depression set in. Because I was realizing at the age of 20, I had just been convicted and given a total of 60 years in the Texas Department of Corrections for a crime that I had literally no knowledge of. Wow. So let me just, yeah, well, that, that's an amazing story. I can't imagine that story in anybody's life. I mean, that's just incredible. Uh, but going back to your quote that, that where you said that you were kidnapped by a system that stripped you of your sense of individuality. Can you tell us how, in your experience, a prison system does this? And, and and what do you think is the goal of the prison system in doing this? Yeah, so I mean, when we look at the the true, the true definition of kidnap is, being, is when one person is taken against their own will in a forceful manner. Right. So that was my situation personified times 100. If you go to the National Registry of Exonerations, you're going to see over 3,400 men and women that's been wrongfully incarcerated that have been victims of a system that literally kidnapped them, whether it was intentional or not intentional. So I'm not the only person that's experienced this here. I am only a, a, a drop in the bucket. But what I feel like happens is, is when you go to prison, the first thing that I encountered was Richard Miles died. My wow. dreams, my aspirations ceased to exist. The, for the first four years in prison, I worked in the fields. Texas is one of the, there are only five prisons that, that still use the field force labor and don't compensate individuals that are working in prison. And so imagine working in the fields, having the officer on the horse, having the, the dogs in the woods. It's very reminiscent of, of a dark history that we have to kind of navigate through. And so that experience, taking away my identity, giving me a number and using me as a commodity was not an experience that's conducive for somebody that wants to return home or that can return home. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, when we were talking, we talked about prison culture and, and you definitely, you jumped on that word. You said there definitely is a culture in prison. Can you just kind of explain that culture a little bit? And, and what did you take away from your prison experience that 
has improved your life? Yeah, there, there is definitely a culture that exists in prison. Prison is a world outside of the normal world that we live in. There are there is a, a a real high level of respect in prison. People don't believe that, but in order for you to get along with somebody that you don't know, that's potentially from a totally different background, there has to be a level of respect there. And so I will say that prison incorporates a high level of respect for other people. I will also say that prison breeds about a sense of paranoia because you are around, particularly on Cofield unit, it was, five, it was a 5,000 man unit, mm -hmm. right? And you are actually engaging with people that's committed crimes, right? I believe that we should have institutions that are made to rehabilitate individuals that have been convicted of crimes. But to live in that culture is very, is very different from living out here. I will say in prison, you learn to value not only life, but freedom. My dad passed six months before I got out. My grandmother passed while I was in prison. I couldn't go to their funerals, but I had to mourn their loss without being in the presence of family, right? So there's a lot of things that are taken away from you that you have to create a culture of joy just to survive in the institution. Wow. I'm just trying to absorb that one. You know what? This is, there's so much here that we could talk about. I think what I'm going to have to do is jump ahead just a little bit. And because one of the things that I'm, I was really interested in is that you, you were talking about on your website, you said walking out of the Dallas County Jail. So you'd obviously gone from a prison to a jail uh, for release. You said you were released, but not relieved. I was physically freed physically, but mentally and emotionally still bound. Support was a need. Success was a goal. Can you just talk about that a little bit? What were you, what were you, why did you write that? Yes, sir. So my case is very interesting. My case is the first non-DNA, no confession case in the state of Texas. It's ex parte. Richard Miles is in the Southwest Third edition of the law books. When I walked out of prison at the age of 34, after spending 15 years in prison, I was released, right? But I wasn't free. Released is an opportunity to engage back with society. Freedom is an opportunity to grow inwardly. If you look mm. up the word freedom, one of the interesting things that they correlate to freedom is the word joy. Well, joy is an internal gift, which means your freedom should not be dependent upon circumstances around you, right? And so for me, coming out of prison, it was a release. It was a happiness, but I was still chained up, so much like Lazarus. Lazarus was an individual from the scriptures that had died. Jesus called him forth. He was released from death, but he still had to free him from the dead clothes. Mm -hmm. So many people are coming out of prison released, but they are still wrapped in the culture of prison mm -hmm. or they're wrapped in the culture that sent them to prison. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just listening to you talk, I can see the segue there to the organization that you that you created. But I have to ask you this. So I, and I know that was it the Innocence Project that stepped in and helped you finally get released? Yes, sir. It was, so it was Centurion Ministries, which is a innocence organization in Princeton, New Jersey. And, and I have to say, David, when I first got to Cofield Unit, they sent me to the barber shop to get my hair cut. Now I'm 21 years old. I have 60 years and I am totally lost. God strategically put a barber in the barber shop that was also innocent. His name is Benjamin Spencer. Benjamin Spencer just got out about two years ago. He did 34 years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. 
when Ben was cutting my hair on my first day on the unit, he was asking me, man, what are you in here for? And I told him my story and he gave me the address to Centurion on Witherspoon at that point in time in Princeton. And he said, if you're innocent and it sounds like you have a non-DNA case, this is the only organization that works on non-DNA cases and you need to write them. And I wrote them. And they sent me back a letter stating that due to the overwhelming responses of actual innocence, it takes a minimum of 10 years before we're able to get on someone's case. Well, that may sound bad, but the state just gave me 60. So 10 years was a light of hope for me, even in a dark situation. Yeah, I hear that. You know what, did, did the state of Texas ever apologize or make amends with you? You know, when I got out of prison, one of the things that we had to do as wrongfully imprisoned people, we had to advocate for compensation. There was nothing that was ever given to us. We had to fight for everything. And so for the first two years after my release, we would find ourselves in Austin, Texas, lobbying for compensation so that we could restore our lives. I do remember when my judge, Judge Andy Chatham in the 282nd Court, when I was finally released, he shook my hand and he apologized for what had happened to me. And, and while I accepted that, I, I kind of akin that to, I would have rather the judge that actually sentenced me or the, the prosecutor that actually sentenced me to extend that apology more so than the body that they were a part of. But I accepted what was provided. Yeah, well, good for you. Okay, I want to talk about this. How did you start Miles of Freedom, your nonprofit organization? What was your driving motivation? I can probably guess, but I want you to talk about it. So a couple of things, you know, while I was in prison, my dad voluntold me to start a Bible study. So I'm actually in prison. We started this Bible study through our church. And so I found myself serving individuals incarcerated even before I was released. And so the heart to serve those incarcerated was imparted into me even before I walked out of prison. When I walked out of prison, I understood that every person returning home from prison, whether innocent or guilty, that's a whole nother subject, whether innocent or guilty, there is support and assistance that's needed based upon the structures and the lack of rehabilitative resources within our prison system. And so my thought was always, how can we create an organization that provides holistic support? Because for historical purposes, reentry has only been helping the person coming home from prison. But what about the family that was structured or fractured because of the incarceration? What about the community that they will return home to that are oftentimes not properly funded from governmental agencies or et cetera that creates this cesspool of recidivism, right? And so creating Miles of Freedom with a primary focus of providing assistance for individuals, families, and communities impacted by incarceration was a must. Upon my exoneration, in 2012, I was financially compensated, but the money didn't make any difference to me because it came from a very dark space. Yeah. Yeah. And my thought was always, how can I make this make somebody else's life better? And so we seeded Miles of Freedom in 2012, and we're walking into 12 years next year. So what was that like at the very beginning? The very beginning was interesting because, you know, when you're starting a nonprofit, so I'm the founder, president, and the CEO, and when you're starting a nonprofit, you have to go through stages of trust. And so building a social service, the first level of trust is to the demographics that you're willing to serve. And so for us coming out, we had to prove to the community first that we were capable, compassionate, and consistent about being there for them. That was the first thing. And so that was a challenge for 
our organization, building up social services, building in case management pieces that were going to be not only beneficial, but they would fit the problem. I think a lot of times when we go to help people, we go with the intentions of how we want to help them and not necessarily how they need to be helped. Uh, good, but good distinction. After, yes, but after gaining the trust with the community, then it was gaining the respect with foundations, individual donors, you know, and so that's grown. Um, but it's always been a one step at a time sticking true to our mission, how can we be more transparent financially, getting data, and be, just really being, we consider ourselves as the usher in the church. You know, we, we slightly grab your hand as you walk in and we lead you to where we want you to sit. It's not a forceful move, but we, wanna, we want the person to know that we're walking beside them. Yeah. So how do the inmates coming out of a prison learn about your program? You know, word of mouth is, 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 is you know, it, it flies fast. Uh, uh, I have been blessed to, to do a lot of things that have made headways in 2019. I was a CNN hero. We've done some work with legislation. You know, I go back into the prisons. We have a shuttle van that goes to the prisons. And so, a lot of our stuff is word of mouth. The other thing, well, don't worry about that. That was my light that fell. Don't worry about it. The other thing is parole. We, we network with parole officers, with judges, with referral case agencies. Uh, some of our caseworkers go to the, the pre-release facilities and they do workshops there as well. So we're really on the ground, engaging um, people and keeping the word out there. Yeah. Do you have an application form for folks? You know, we don't have an application form. It's walk in. We are. You can walk in or you can call to RSVP. You'll sit down and talk with a case manager. And I, our biggest qualification is if you've been convicted of a felony in your past, and you need assistance and you're serious about assistance, then you can come in. The only time that we actually have to turn someone away is if they are challenged with issues that we don't have capacity to deal with or work with. So if they have drug, if drug usage is is, is an issue, then obviously that's not within our world with all. And so networking with partners is kind of like that best thing at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what kind of character traits are you looking for in an applicant? You know, I, I've learned over, over the time, over times is is we, we kind of go about in deliverables. And so if you come in, you're going to lay out, you know, I need my ID because most people come home without their ID card. And so we will, right. the case managers work in a phase of deliverables. And so they will give them a task to do. And if they go out and they accomplish this deliverable, we will provide the resource, whether it's a bus pass or whatever, or the phone number. If they accomplish that goal and they come back, then to us, that's showing an interest, that's showing motivation, that's showing that this person wants to change. And so I think the willingness based upon their actions is really the only attribute that we are willing to look for because we can work with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's like further moral transformation, I'll call it, is needed by someone that's interested in your program, how do you help them become morally ready to be successful on the outside? I, I, you know, I, I read that question, David, and, and I had to, I, I did some research. I had to do some homework because morals are so connected to our values. And so a lot of times we chase the morals, but we really should try to shift the person's values. Because if you shift the person's value, a person a person may value um, being successful, right? But they might be dishonest. And so they may value dishonesty just to be successful. And so yeah. how can we work with individuals to value shift their perspective, which will in the end shift their morals? which are their actions that are results of their misplaced values or whatever. 
Yeah. Wow. Well, it seems clear that you're involved in the work of, of transforming people's lives. Um, how, how would you define moral transformation? And, and and then what evidence would you look for that, you know, shows you that some dumb aspect of moral transformation has taken place? Well, I mean, you know, from, from what I've looked at, moral moral transformation is the manifestation of great values. Yeah. Right. And so when a person's actions have changed, then it's easy to say that their morals are in a line. And mm -hmm. we know that it'll be consistent because we have addressed their values that have been shifted, maybe because of the community that they grew up in, maybe mm -hmm. because of situations that they've been through that we can't change. So we really look at a person's actions. Are they actions, have their actions changed consistently? So with our grants, we're, we're, you know, United Way is one of our supporters and we do the 30, 60, 90, 100 day follow up with the individuals that we work with. Well, if somebody has came in and in 180 days, they're still on their job, they're still in college, we can say that there has been a moral transformation in that person because their actions are yeah. different. And we can say that because their values have been shifted. Yeah, that's a great definition, I think. You know, on your website, and this is kind of my last question here, and then before we kind of turn it over to the, uh, our audience, but on your website, you you use the words that sort of described what your mission is. You say, bridging the gap from prison to promise. Now, I, and I love that. But what does Miles of Freedom actually do, you know, like on a day-to-day -day basis that fulfills this promise, you know, for former inmates? Yes, sir. So I would like I, I let I would interject as well. Miles is acronyms. It's my name. My, it's my last name, but it's acronyms for motivating, inspiring, law-abiding, enthusiastic, and successful. It's uh, what we want every person to be that we engage with. We want you to be motivating, inspired, law-abiding, enthusiastic, and successful. Success is different in every person's mind, right? And so your promise of success, sometimes when people come into the office, success to them is getting that FAFSA form filled out and getting back in college to achieve their chemical, de chemical dependence certification, right? Their success might be reuniting with a family member. Ultimately, we want it to be employment with livable wage income, right? And so it's really meeting the people where there are and getting them to those milestones that they consider as being successful. Not really what we feel success is, but if your level of success is in a progressive manner, we want to get you there. So that bridge from prison to promise, it's not just the physical prison. It's the mental prison. It's yeah. the spiritual prisons. It's not just physically walking out of prison and that's a promise because you can yeah. walk out and be mentally in prison and just be as incarcerated free as you was behind bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good point. Finally, I just want you to just say, tell us a little bit about the different programs that you offer and and why people find them valuable and needed. Yes, sir. So ultimately, our, our SPEAR program, our key program is the reentry assistance program. <laughs> we have an awesome case, awesome, awesome set of uh, case managers, about four. I think we just hired one. We have a staff of 12. And so that's, as I said earlier, anybody can walk in and it's any type of services. We are very detail in our services because they are individually based and they are very client centric. So whether it's getting clothes, getting ID, working on your resume, getting job referrals, that happens on a 24-7 on a 24-7 um, basis when you come into the office. As as we've grown into this space, We've introduced mental health assistance, partnering with psychiatrists, et cetera. We're working on an opportunity with some pro bono attorneys for legal assistance. 
We have a food pantry that kicked off in 2019 where individual members that's a part of Miles of Freedom are feeding the community. This food pantry is no income restriction, no zip code restriction. We've distributed over 3 million pounds of food with our partnership from the North Texas Food Bank. We just got a capacity building grant to expand that opportunity. Very early on when we started, we understood that we want to be a sustainable solution in this space. And so we have a lawn service that's actual a social business. This lawn service gains dollars and contracts through commercial and residential contracts and individuals that are actually in case management. They have an opportunity to get on the lawn service and be paid until they graduate out of this case management space and we're able to hire them to more livable wage employees. Um, finally, as I said earlier, our shuttle service was really, really well pre-COVID, getting family members to loved ones that was incarcerated. Now our shuttle service services the community. And so we may have an organization that wants to do a tour. We may have prison ministries that want to go to the prisons. We allow our shuttle service to be a resource for other organizations in the community that we serve and those that are working in this space of reentry. It's amazing that you just, you know, you just start taking a step and another step unfolds and another one unfolds. And next thing you know, it's not the same organization. It's a better one. It's yes, kind of what, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's sort of what we're finding in in our in our journey. We'd love to partner with you guys for sure. And I think there's a, a lot we could do for each other. But I I love your story. I'm just going to open this up to anybody here that that's got a question that I didn't ask, and I didn't ask you know all the questions I have here because <laughs> you guys need a chance to ask some questions. Go ahead. Anybody want to jump in and and ask ask Richard something? Bonnie. This was fascinating, and I really appreciate it. And I'm a chaplain at the Lansing Prison in Kansas, and we have an individual who had been falsely accused and has been in prison since age 16, and he's 42 getting out. And, and, and it's very similar to what you've been talking about. But what in, as a chaplain, I've really worked to have them realize their spiritual identity. Because in prison, they're just simply stripped of every bit of that identity. I think that's part of their control. It's a number and a last name, and they all dress alike. And But to realize their spiritual identity, and I've talked about this before, but that to realize that all we, only own, all we own, the only thing we own is our thought. Mm -hmm. And how to, how to move that thought and as I was listening to you, I, I thought, you know, it's from the values to the moral is changing the frame of reference in their thought of, mm -hmm. of how they make their choices to shift it to, I, I talk about the Ten Commandments because mm -hmm. I, I tell them, you know, it's 3,000 years old and it's still in the courthouses. Mm -hmm. and And they say, well, how can you be so wise? And I said, well, you make your choices based upon the commandments and and you were not you, your situation is amazing i mean you know what you went through and you were young and this individual was young that i'm going to be working with the, the prison system is sending him to five, to 5 months to acclimate him be, to be released but i will work with him through embrace fully as a team angel for him because his whole record is being expunged. Mm -hmm. And so it allows me to do that. But again, this to go back to, to our, our spiritual identity and not the mortal identity, which gets confused and the chaos and, the, mm -hmm. and all the things that go on. And I just like to hear your thoughts about that in terms of your experience. That, that, that's a, that's a great, Perception, great question, Ms. Bonnie. I remember, so I had been locked up 11 years. I had turned 30. And around this time, I had literally, so I, 
I, I, I kind of say I was raised up under the church. My dad, remember, we kind of like went to church every day. It was, it was like ingrained in me. And so it got to a point where in prison, because the physical wasn't changing, my, 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 my faith was, was, was slowly being challenged. <laughs> and I remember my mom, and so two things was happening. I remember my mom coming to visit me one time and she was asking me, she said, Richard, she, I guess she noticed I was depressed. And she was like, Richard, what do you see when you look out the window? I said, what do you mean? I said, I see the barbed wire. I see the guard towers. I see the wreck yard. And she said, next time you look out the window, look up. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm still incarcerated, but I, what you just said, I shifted my perception and I looked up over the physical barriers in which I was physically confined in. I didn't see the bars. I didn't see the bar. They were still there, but my perception right. had been shifted. Mm -hmm. And I accepted that and I embraced this opportunity to understand that it, regardless of the physical condition that I'm in, it's my perception that's going to either allow me to win or to lose. And so, yes, to your point, that spiritual perception has to be addressed. And fast forward, I was working in the infirmary and the infirmary is a very... You got to really stay out of trouble to get in the infirmary. And so I was blessed. I was like Joseph. I had favor that was really on me during my incarceration. So I experienced the system in a different manner, but I'm working in the infirmary. And the, the people will come in and they will say, good morning, Mr. Miles. This was the first time that I was addressed as Mr. Miles because these are nurses and doctors that are coming to help, they're not officers that are coming to enforce the law. So they think differently. Their perception is different. And my response, Bonnie, was always, all right, all right. So they say, good morning. And I say, all right, all right. And one of the ladies asked me, she said, Richard, we say good morning every morning. Why is your response just all right? She challenged me because for the past 11 years, when I woke up and I saw my celly, it wasn't me saying good morning. It was me looking at my celly and say, you all right? My celly looks back at me. I'm all right. I'm all right. Mm -hmm. I was becoming institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this lady who saw it, she told me. So it's not just your perception, it's your physical engagement that's even more of a challenge that you got to wake up and say, I can't become institutionalized. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Richard. James, got your hand up. There we go. There you go. Um, sorry, got here a little late. So you may have already talked about this, but when you were talking about the people mowing yards and stuff, I was thinking of, I don't know if you've read Gregory Boyle's books, Tattoos on the Heart, and how mm. he works with gangs, but he gets, he gives some jobs and it gives them, you know, a sense of purpose and they get some money. And so I'm, I'd love to know the transformation you've seen when somebody actually comes out they actually get a job. They're actually making real money, and and the difference that makes. I volunteer in a Dan the Danbury, Connecticut, FCI, and you know a lot of people are worried about when they get out. What are they going to do? And so just you know how you find those jobs and the and how it makes them feel when they know they can keep that job and make the money. Yeah, that's a great question. On our Facebook page, we just recently posted. We, the hospitality industry is one of the spaces where we have been just really successful with getting people hired on. When I first got out, the assistant pastor at our church got me a job at the Hilton 
and I worked there until I was exonerated. And so that relationship between myself and that GM carried over to Miles of Freedom. And so he gave me a call and he was like, hey, man, if you ever have anybody that wants a job, man, you send them to me. Just about two weeks ago, this guy named Willard Rock, Willard Wiley was flew to Las Vegas. He was given the best Ambridge employee national. They flew him to Las Vegas and we got him a job five, five six years ago. He's the lead engineer mm -hmm. and he was acknowledged in Vegas at the Ambridge Hilton event, you know? And so you're talking about hope, you know, you're talking about empowering someone and somebody that has seen a transformation in their life because they stuck to it. And even on a granular level, when we see the men and women, when they go out on the lawn service, you know, and you cut somebody yard, that's instant, gratification, instant change that you can see. You can walk into a yard, grass is up here, shrubs is over there, hanging over, and your actions has changed the look of this person's space, the, 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 the feeling that you walk away with, or when they're putting food in somebody's car. During COVID, this was the time when our organization really became the strongest because we shifted to the drive-through. And here we have men and women that have been incarcerated feeding people that's probably never seen a jail. Oh. But because they are a part of a solution, that's how people want to be a lot of times, is how can I be a part of, part of the solution? Can you create a space of, for me to be a part of a solution? And so we see empowerment in that, James. We see self-rehabilitation because we understand the system isn't set up to rehabilitate. The system, our prison system was never created to rehabilitate. It was strictly punitive. It's people like you all that import rehabilitation into a punitive system. And we have to understand that we can't ask from the system what the system was never created to do. Thank you. We are at seven o'clock, a little after. Any any takers here before we close out? Is that Bonnie again? Hello. Yeah. I've got a question to ask you again. I have talked to the inmates about the, that they are really imprisoned in their own thought, and that the time that they're there is like in the Bible, being in the wilderness, where they're alone with their thought, and it gives them the opportunity to process and, and to study and to read the, the, the lesson sermons that we share. And But the other thing that I share is that <clears throat> with their thought, there's two versions of the Lord's Prayer. One is forgive us our debts, and the other one said to forgive those that trespass against us. But those that trespass on our thought to convince us to go in a way that probably we shouldn't be going and to learn how to, when to accept that influence and when not to accept that influence. And, and they understand that. They understand that, but they don't always have that frame of reference to know how to, to judge it. But to be, but to realize that they own their thoughts, but just don't let people trespass on them. That that may be malicious or to divert your thought, to change your thought, to convince you to join something that you think probably isn't the right place and to trust your intuition about that. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, when I got out, I had to, as the scripture says, forgive us our debts and right. those trespasses. And so the system really, I mean, it hurt me. It hurt my family. And, and, and when you get out and there's no true forgiveness there, 
forgiveness, it, it, I think that the, the concept of forgiveness is oftentimes misinterpreted. It's, it's forgiveness is really, I forgive any actions of retribution to you, to the person that hurt you, right? Anything that I want to do as a result, because you've done something to me, I release myself of any actions against you. And I had to accept that forgiveness that only God can introduce to a person. And it's oftentimes after you've been broken that you can really get the true meaning of what forgiveness is, right? And 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 it's it's hard when you've been broken, but you have to realize that you're being broken for a reason, right? The scripture says what? That a broken and a contrite heart and spirit is the only thing that he requires. But we want to come to him with the whole spirit. And he's saying you need to be broken because when I pour into you, I want what I pour into you to go out to others. I want you to be broken in a manner to where as the pieces that life has cracked you, that you find meaning in those broken spaces. Because you're still usable. You're still a vessel of use. And so I think that really getting people that's going through incarceration to understand that there is a meaning in your brokenness. There is a reason, there is a use for your brokenness that is still applicable to not only society, but it's applicable to yourself and being a better person. Yeah. I David Fowler's told me that one of the healings is that they need to learn to like themselves. Mm-hmm know themselves and to like themselves. And that's part of forgiving. Mm -hmm. and, letting, and you, letting go of the anger and the frustrations and the resentment. And, and we teach a lot about God is love. And it's learning to love, your, love God and love yourself. And as you forgive, you have to do it with love. Not easy, and, not easy. And I think that, it, well, I think, I know that you, you all are moving. So the, the, the best book of reentry in the Bible is the book of Philemon. Philemon is the book of reentry. It places the church, i.e. Paul, in prison, who's in prison for preaching the word, which is establishing the gospel. And he encounters a gentleman by the name of Onesimus. Now, history is different about Onesimus. Some say Onesimus was innocent. Some say Onesimus was actually guilty. But Onesimus loved on Paul. Paul loved on Onesimus. Paul changes Onesimus' life. But Paul went even further because of the change in his life. And so much like Embrace Fully right now, Paul writes Philemon. And he said, accept Onesimus back not out of duty, not out of parole, but out of brotherly love. Mm -hmm. So when you all go in and love on the men and the women in prison, you are fulfilling Paul's initial mission. But when you engage him out, out here, you're fulfilling God's whole mission. As he said, don't forget about those that are incarcerated because he knew our systems was unjust. That's why he said, don't forget about the widows and yep. those in prison, because he knew that the systems were not going to always be right. And so those that are righteous must look out for the systems that are not right. That's great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Marilyn? You got your hand up. You want to unmute? You got a question? No, I just have a statement to add. You just a wonderful example example of doing God's work to be a free man. I want to share with you a life lesson that's really stuck with me. One of the most important ones, a very simple one that my mother taught me, and you're already living it. The brave become bolder, the darker the night. 
and you're already living that. And thank you for all the strength and the love that you're imparting. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, anybody else? Gabriel? Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Richard. This was really wonderful to hear. I feel like your story is one of those examples of probably probably what a lot of people who who did commit a crime wish they could have right. the the second half of the experience that you've had. And I I know I've sort of heard that there are a, a lot of people who maintain their innocence even though they have been convicted. I guess one question I've got for you is if if we have any chaplains working with individuals who sort of are continuing to maintain that they are innocent truly, do you have any sort of practical tips for those chaplains to sort of assist in any way or any organizations to put somebody in touch with that you would recommend? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So interesting. So the the organization that I was, that worked on my case, if you look at the history of Centurion, Jim McCluskey was a Presbyterian, he was in Presbyterian seminary, and he was actually licensed to go into a Jersey state prison where he was taking the gospel to a gentleman named Carlos Santiago, and this gentleman was actually innocent. And so this guy actually challenges Jim. He said, man, you're coming in here, bringing this word to me, going back home, praying. What are you going to do? Because I'm innocent. And so Jim did the unusual. He stopped going to seminary, started working on this gentleman's case, proved he was innocent, and he formed Centurion Ministries, the Innocence Organization. And so what I would, I would, I wouldn't encourage chaplains to do that. You know, that, that was just what Jim did, but really understand and ed educate themselves. And I can provide the, the, uh, the numbers to organizations that I'm comfortable with, you know, Centurion, uh, Innocent Project of Texas, Innocent Project of New York. Also, there are conviction integrity units, which started in Dallas, every DA's office should have a conviction integrity unit, which is a unit within the DA's office whose sole purpose is investigating claims of actual innocence. And so I would encourage chaplains to pass that information on, you know, to the person, but to not get too engaged because that's a very lengthy journey. It took them 10 years for them to get on my case. And so you want to steer clear of the, the discipleship and the resources uh, that that person may need to, to overturn their case or whatever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Susan, do you have your hand up? Yes, thank you so much, Richard. This is so inspiring. I feel how my question is your a solid foundation of life in the church has to have contributed to your 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 pathway forward to what to to your organization that you've done now how do you help the folks who haven't had that foundation who've had you know a, not a tender relationship with parents, not a tender relationship with God. And how do you help them find that and recognize their own innate integrity that they might not think they have? That's a, that's a great question, Ms. Susan. And so, so I, I will say you are most definitely correct. My experience has been what I would refer to as the word going from logos to rainbow. Most of us only know the scriptures from a logos standpoint, which is the written word. 
Very few of us have had an opportunity to experience the word from a Ramos perspective, which means the word has become life to you at that point in time. For me, going into prison, I had read about Joseph being wrongfully incarcerated and how he goes into Egypt and all of it. To me, it was just something that I did in Bible study until I found myself in prison with 60 years, right? And so it's at that point to where as do we disregard the teachings that we have been given spiritually because we're challenged with what we're going through physically. So that was my transition. And what I've learned is, as, as your question was, how do I get other people? I'm just a light. I, I, I'm not here to judge, but I am here to illuminate Christ through my experiences. And if somebody asks me, how did you get to like this? Or, it wasn't me. You know, it was more than the Innocence Organization, right? Mm. It was God that really provided the resources that got me to the point. So always giving credit to whom credit is due. That's, I think, our first thing as believers is never accept the credit when we know God deserves the credit. And the other thing is not just accept the logos, but re be ready for the rhema because you can possess faith, but activating faith and possessing faith is two different things. Yeah, I just, it's the ones who don't know God, but I mm -hmm. guess they wouldn't come to you if they didn't have some desire there's they, they recognize that light may not right. realize the source of it but i guess it really we have a quote in our, one of the books that we read desire is prayer it doesn't mean a desire for a car you know it means mm -hmm. the desire for a, a a better thought place so that must be the road that you're helping those folks on is how to speak to them without and when, what about the ones who don't want to hear the word God? Mm -hmm. Then how do you reach them? What do you what do you say instead? Yeah, you know, I think that our life is the scriptures that people will read. Oh, so, good. Well, that's a quote. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> write that one down. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> we don't. I mean. Even though we may want to say, let your light, what to say, let your light so shine. Yeah. That when men see you, they see the good works, but glorify the Father within you. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. let your life be the scriptures. Let you become yeah. the Bible word in somebody else's life, right? Yeah. And, and if by chance you have an opportunity to tell them how and why, then that's an opportunity to minister to them. Right. Yeah. But it's really us working out our own, you know, as the scripture says, salvation with fear and trembling. Yes, uh, indeed. And and being that light. That's the only thing that we can do. When when we try to do more than that, now we're trying to be God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And we have to steer, we have to stay clear from that. Let me do what I can do. Let me stay in my lane and let me let yeah, yeah. the scripture says what? One plant, one waters, but God gives the increase. Yes, 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 yes. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> That's yes, beautiful. I, I wish you weren't so far away. <laughs> I'm have... in Washington State. I'd I'd love to just come to your office. <laughs> <laughs> little bit of your light shine oh my gosh so thank you for sharing yeah <laughs> i have a very quick question richard you talked about going from logos and you kept saying another word and i don't know that word i don't know how it's spelled could yeah. you tell me what word this is r-h-e-m-a rhema r-h-e-m-a e-m-a r-h-e-m-a yeah. Okay. And that's a Greek word? Greek. Yes. Okay. I will look yes. that up. Thank you. Yes. Well, I feel like we could chat all night, but this <laughs> was really generous of your time. Thank you so much. It is it is an honor to speak with somebody who has served 
the time that you've gone through and gone through that experience and, and gotten to the other side of that, it's, I think, quite inspiring to to hear that sometimes, sometimes uh, right wrongs can be righted a little bit. And I hope, I hope that it feels like it has been righted for you in your life, that wrong that you suffered. And thank you. Thank you so much. And why don't we wrap it up there, David, unless if you had any other. I do. I just got one last thing I want to tell everybody here, including Richard, just a reminder, May 4th in Dallas, we've invited you to be there. So, and you did say yes. <laughs> yes so, <I> did. <laughs> everybody just give you, this is just a heads up. Richard's going to be in Dallas, Texas on May the 4th at the Embrace Fully Conference. We hope heads to up. see you all there. And, and I'll, I'll just probably end with one more little plug. If any of you have any end of the year giving that you still would like to do, please consider a gift to Embrace Fully or to Miles of Freedom, Richard's group. Either one of those would be an excellent spot to help make a difference. So what were you going to say, Bob? Yeah, I thank you, Gabriel. I, I have one thing to say, and I'd like all of us to just join in a heartfelt Thank you and appreciation, Richard, for sharing this time with us. And we, we loved it. it. You were outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Bob. And I'm waiting to see them pictures, Bob. Next time we have lunch, I need uh, to see the pictures. <laughs> you are. You're going to see those pictures. And I look forward to meeting with Tanya as well. Yes, yes. Now, after the first of the year, we've already made a schedule a meeting so i'll get to learn more about miles of freedom and how we can partner in the future so thank you so much for that invitation thank you as well thank you okay thank you everybody bye-bye good night everybody good night thank you hi thank you god bless thank you, thank you so much richard thank you gabriel